Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our workshop tonight. Uh, my name is Brian Cofrancesco, and I'm the Leadership Development Coordinator for the New England and Bermuda District, and a proud member of the Kiwanis Club of Merritt in Connecticut. And it is so great to see so many of you here uh, watching with us on Zoom, and welcome to those who are watching on Facebook tonight. Our workshop tonight is about recruiting millennials to Kiwanis, and this is the third session in our May series of membership workshops. Overall, it is the 23rd session in our virtual workshop series. Thank you to many of you who've been joining us faithfully since the beginning. Yeah, give yourselves a round of applause. We hope you're enjoying these sessions and that you'll encourage others in your club to continue to join us every Wednesday at 7 p.m. If your members or you are not receiving our emails with information of district news and the registration for these workshops, you can contact us at education at newenglandkiwanis.org, and we'll take a look. And Elise is going to drop that link in the chat, as well as a link to the registration for our May workshops. So if you aren't signed up to join us next week, or if you have a fellow club member who would like to register, please share that link with them. A reminder to those of you who've joined us before and to those who are here for the first time, that all of our workshops do have the potential to count as interclubs on your monthly secretary's report. If your club has enough members attending the workshop, to qualify for credit, you can report an interclub with every single club that's here in attendance tonight. So as always, to help everyone determine the number of interclubs they can report, please introduce yourself in the chat, send a quick message with your name and your club. If you're not familiar with where the chat is, just look, chat is, look for the little uh, speech bubble and little flashes coming from it. And that's where you can send a message to everyone. If you are looking to track interclub attendance for your secretary, you can do one of three things. One, write down the names of the clubs as they appear in the chat. Two, in the chat, you can click the dot, dot, dot ellipses and you can save the chat, which will download after we conclude tonight. And that will give you the list of all of the clubs based on the chat conversation. Or three, you can check our Google Drive of resources in the next week or so for an updated list of all the clubs that were re represented here tonight. And thanks to our interclub liaison, David Griffin, um, and our technology expert, Elise Denorfia, who get those coordinated and uploaded every week, we do the tracking for you. And if you need a link to that, we'll put it in the chat, but you can also find it in your confirmation email that you received this morning. So before we get started with our workshop, a few housekeeping items. Please mute yourself to ensure an uninterrupted presentation. And if you're new to Zoom, um, the mute button is in the lower left-hand corner. Um, you're likely already muted, um, but if you do find yourself unmuted, please uh, immediately do that if we haven't done it already. You are welcome to keep your camera on. We love to see everyone's smiling faces, but that is not required. And for optimal viewing tonight, we recommend you to change your Zoom view to speaker view. So that is going to be probably in one of the corners of your screen. You will see an option to change from gallery to speaker view. And because we won't have any slides shared tonight, that'll give you a clear view of everyone who is speaking. If you have questions for our panel tonight, you can post them in the chat. You can send them directly to me. And if you're on Facebook, you can leave them in the stream and we will ask them at the end in our question and answer. Tonight's presentation will be about an hour and you'll be able to find recordings on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. So with that, we are ready to get started. Um, as I mentioned, or as you've seen in our registration and in our uh, forms, May is membership month. So we are focusing all of this month's workshops on membership. And tonight we have an exciting panel discussion for you. Uh, those of you who've attended district conferences know that we've had conversations in the past about recruiting younger, often millennial, we'll say members to Kiwanis. But it's not too often that you get to hear from millennial Kiwanians. And that was the inspiration behind this workshop tonight. You will get to meet millennials from all across New England and Bermuda and hear why they joined Kiwanis and what they look for in a Kiwanis club. The term millennial, uh, many people have heard it, but they're not sure what exactly it means. Um, most sources agree, not everybody, that the term millennial applies to someone who was born between the years of 1981 and 1996, meaning that they are currently between the ages of 25 and 40. And that is what applies to our panel tonight. Our host is Carl Uskadegi, our district editor, and he will facilitate a discussion and then a question and answer session with our panelists. 
And as I said, if you have questions for our panelists, we love the interaction and getting engagement from you as our attendees. Please send them to me in the chat and I will pass them along to Carl. So without further ado, please join me in a warm welcome for Carl and our panel of Millennial Kiwanians. Thank you, Brian. Um, so just to start off with our panel tonight, we will be doing a land acknowledgement. Um, so um, just to begin, we acknowledge that the lands each of us live, learn, and thrive on are the traditional ancestral and unseceded homelands of um, indigenous and tribal nations. My home is the original homelands of the Wampanoag tribal nations. We acknowledge the we acknowledge the genocide and systems of oppression um, that have um, dispossessed indigenous people of their lands, and we honor and respect the diverse and beautiful peoples still connected to this land. If you are new to land acknowledgements, we encourage you to look for reputable resources of information. We have provided our suggestions on how to advance in this work within the chat. So just give us a moment and you'll see that there. And we'll make sure that that shared with you after the presentation as well for those that weren't able to attend. So tonight I get the pleasure of introducing um, our lovely panelists with us today. Um, in a moment, I will um, go, um, I will ask our panelists to introduce themselves in the following order with Will, Danielle, Gary, and Melissa. Uh, they will be sharing with you um, their name, Kiwanis Club, um, if they have a pronoun, their years in Kiwanis, um, and if they've been in any branches um, that um, they've been a part of in Kiwanis. So we'll start off with you, Will. Thank you, Carl. Uh, my name is Will Bradford. I joined Kiwanis in 2013, and uh, that's eight, I think, doing subtraction in my head, <laughs> eight years in Kiwanis. Um, prior to that, I was in Circle K for four years and Key Club for three years. Um, I am currently a member of the Greater Boston Young Professionals Kiwanis Club, um, and I was previously a member of the Kiwanis Club of Somerville. Uh, my name is Danielle Cook. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a the president of the Greater Boston Young Professionals Club. This is my second full year, I believe, in Kiwanis. Um, but I was in Circle K all throughout college and was very involved there. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> Hello, good day. My name is Gary Pitt, and I am part of the Kiwanis Club of Hamilton, Bermuda. I have been a part of Kiwanis Club for the last 10 years. And prior to that, I was in Key Club when I was in high school for one year. Hello, I am Melissa Neville Passarelli, and I am a member of the Kiwanis Club of Meriden, Connecticut. I am also their secretary. And I've been in there, I think about nine years now, and I was in Builders Club and I was in Key Club. Hello. Hello, my name is Roman Lavo. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. Um, so we will um, start. Um, I will first, I'm, so for those that don't know me, I'm an educator. So I would be doing a disservice if I didn't provide you a bit of um, tippets before we begin on tonight's questioning. So I came with a statistic for you all, um, but um, published by Statistia Research Department, um, millennials, um, so this is the, what they have discovered. Uh, millennials will outsize the baby boomers generation and will become the largest living generation sometime soon. That's very ambiguous. Um, the millennial generation refers to the population roughly between the ages of 18 and 34, born um, starting at 1980 and later. Uh, they are the first generation to come of age in the new millennium, and they are the first um, natives of the digital age, with the first of the millennial generation now in their 30s, and the majority of the millennials beginning their careers. They will be an important engineer of the economy in the coming decade. Uh, most notably, it should be highlighted that the millennial generation now well over 40% are now well over 40% minority um, is the most diverse adult generation in American history. 
So just to provide some context for tonight, um, but I'm really excited to start off with our first question for our panelists. Uh, we'll be going in reverse order. So with Melissa, Gary, Danielle, and Will, um, the first question we have is what brought you to Kiwanis and what were you looking for in a club? Well, to be honest, my friend Brian <laughs> told me to, because he knew I had been in Builders Club and Key Club, and I had just gotten out of college not too long ago, like before that. So he's like, you should come, you should come. So I did some service projects. I went to some meetings and I really enjoyed it. And so I joined and I don't know, it, it, it does my heart good just to see like when I, we do cleanups or we do like Canon food drives just to, to see how it helps the community and how, and it, it makes me happy that I could give back to people. So what brought me back uh, to Kulwanis was when I moved back to the island, my Lieutenant Governor Lilith, she had seen me working and she asked me to come back into the club and I didn't do it right away, but then um, a few weeks later, she had seen me again and she asked me to come back and I, I did. And it was good to come back around familiar places who I have seen before way back in Key Club when we was helping out doing like take days or we are doing our local annual holiday um, festivities. So it was great. Um, like I mentioned before, I was pretty heavily involved in Circle K back in Indiana. Um, so when I moved out here to Boston, after I graduated, um, I had a really good relationship with our sponsoring Kiwanis Club then. And so going into Kiwanis wasn't really a scary thing for me at all. Um, and a great story for another time, I basically sought out GBYP and like just appeared on the scene at one of their meetings and just have been there ever since. <laughs> um, but I just, I love serving. I love, I've always loved serving. Um, and helping out the community. And I just knew it was even better that it was a young professionals club for me because I knew I'd be able to relate with them a little bit more. Um, and they'd still probably be pretty active in the service. So, yeah. Um, so I joined Kiwanis because my senior year in college, George Whitney asked me to join the Key Club Adult Committee for the district. And so I got involved my senior year in Circle K and then graduated and said, oh, I guess in order to be on a committee of the Kiwanis district, I should probably become a Kiwanian. And so I actually lived in a neighborhood in Boston at the time that did not have a Kiwanis club. And so I had to go around and, and try to find one that worked for me, um, which the end of that story was I ended up building my own club. Um, but I personally looking for a Kiwanis experience wanted something that gave me the opportunity to do service hands-on. Um, I found that you know, I wasn't necessarily able to give financially at that point in my life, um, by which I mean, I'm still not really able to give financially, um, but it was worse then. Um, so I, at that point in time, had time that I wanted to donate. And so that was really what I looked for in a Kiwanis Club was an opportunity to do service with my hands. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Um, and just so uh, moving forward, I'll also put the question in the chat so that our panelists can reference it, but also for our friends that might be stopping in a little bit um, because you stepped away. So the next question we have is, uh, what, was the, what is the most common myth about millennials? So a fun question. Um, and we'll start back with you, uh, Melissa, and go back around. Um, I, I guess I've heard that we're lazy, which I, I don't agree with because <laughs> I, I, I try to do a lot for our club and we have some, we've had some younger members and we're, I, we show up to like all the service projects and, um, all the fundraisers and stuff. So I, I've heard that, but I don't, I think we're hardworking. <laughs> I think for me, the most uh, common myths about millenniums is that we don't um, have no interest in doing it. Like a lot of us have interest in doing just sports or hanging out with our friends, when really we do have uh, 
a handful of, of people of our age that want to have service to give back to the community and just do right um, to give back. <laughs> Um, I guess mine would be, which in some cases might be true, but not all, that we're very technology driven and on our phones a lot. Um, but I think one, that's just everyone at this point in time. I mean, as you know, we've kind of grown up with technology. So depending on where you fall, like depends on, I think, how much into technology you are. <laughs> um, but I think, honestly, that's a great source to utilize, like use those people that grew up with this technology that knew it from, you know, huge computers and the awful noise of dial up to now being able to do everything on your phone. So I don't know, it might be annoying, but I think it's a pro in some ways. Um, I think to, my answer is very similar to what Melissa said, but I hear the words lazy and entitled a lot when talking about millennials. And I think it's, an unfair characteristic of our generation. Um, a lot of us have kind of lived through some pretty tumultuous times. Um, you know, I was in fifth grade when 9-11 happened, and then we had the economic collapse when I was graduating high school and had to go to college and wasn't sure about getting a job after that, and now COVID and everything going on now. So I think a lot of millennials um, have really had to kind of deal with those things at a, a key point in their young adulthood and childhood. Um, and that's really shaped us in a lot of ways. So we've talked a little bit about our identities. Um, well, how about we talk a little bit about Kiwanis? So for my panelists, um, how do you describe who a Kiwanian is? Um, and certainly, um, are there any common myths about Kiwanis that you heard um, as you were going through the program or as people were trying to, um, maybe you were in an SLP? So. Those are our two questions and we'll start with Will and work our way around with Will, Danielle and so forth. So let's hear it. Okay, um, I would say that a Kiwanian is someone who is community minded and that really drives everything Kiwanis does, whether that's hands-on service, whether that's financial contributions, whether that's having a traditional Kiwanis meeting with speakers from the community. Um, it's all about connection and community and giving back. Um, so I would say that that is the common thread among all Kiwanians. Um, and I wish you would put me last on this one because I don't have an answer for the common myth um, one. But I guess the, the one thing that you hear about Kiwanians all the time is, you're a Kiwanian? Isn't that old guys? Uh, <laughs> and um, unfortunately, that is true for the most part, but we're, we're making progress. <laughs> um, I would echo what Will said about how I would describe a Kwanian. I also, when I describe a Kwanian, I'm kind of referring it to like, okay, and we start with Key Club and we go to Circle K. So in my very generic terms of, it's basically anyone who wants to give back to the community um, and we're better than Rotary and you are, you know, <laughs> out of college, <laughs> you know, um, but I, guess a myth kind of growing up or not growing up but in circle k that i would hear is you know some clubs like circle k clubs just don't have a really good relationship with their kiwanis club so they kind of have that barrier of like kiwanis like i don't know but again i think it's just one of those depends things i, I like i said i had an amazing relationship with my kiwanis club or our sponsoring kiwanis club we went to meetings every single week we'd go to satellite meetings every other week like we had an amazing, amazing relationship. And I just think it's kind of one of those like two way street things. And it just kind of depends on the atmosphere of where you live and what's going on between your clubs. All right, I describe a Kiwanian as just somebody who's willing to help the community and push everybody to be uh, their best. Also, I describe them as being a team player, you know, no matter where, what situation they're putting on, at least, you know, they're willing to basically help out, um, network with different people, and also just, just a, a overall, like, great person and friendly person. Now, the common myths that I haven't heard, um, that I did hear of Kiwanians was not 
nothing in general. It's just basically about myself where people's like, oh my God, you're into everything <laughs> when they see me out volunteering, but it's not towards the club in general because even when I was in the key club, the Kiwanians, they was willing to come around and teach us about the club or teach us about different things and workshops and stuff to help us to become better. Yeah, I guess I would describe a Qantas member as somebody who enjoys service and doesn't mind hard work and yeah, just wants to do the best for their community and of course wants to help out children because that was our focus. And um, yeah, the common myths are that it's yeah, a group for older people. And I know my club, especially, we used to do a fundraiser where we put on a variety show every year. And people didn't know that we were a service organization. They just thought we were a club that put on a show every year. And that was all we did. So we'd have to be like, no, we actually do stuff. We actually, you know, help people. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so um, I just want to remind everyone in the audience, if you do have any questions, please, please, please send those to Brian and we'll make sure to get them. Um, our next question for our group of panelists is, is it worth pursuing millennials as future members? Do they actually have time to serve? Um, I'm gonna pass that over to uh, Will and we'll go in sequence. Uh, so I would say resounding yes to that question. Um, it's in my view, uh, vital to recruit millennials and younger people to Kiwanis because uh, if you want your Kiwanis club to still be here in 30 years, it's you know, it's a sad way to look at it, but um, you need some younger people to get involved now and continue that legacy of service in the community. Um, time is tricky. Um, I can speak with that um, from a lot of experience with our Young Professionals Club. We have averaged probably 10 to 13 members over our five years that we've been around. And the total population of people that we've had in the club is closer to 50. Um, so we've had a lot of turnover because people, um, especially when we recruit them right out of college, have a lot going on and they're in a very transitory phase in their life. Uh, so we have members who join for a couple years and then leave to move to Miami to go to med school or leave because they have kids and they don't have time anymore. Um, so I think it really depends. There are some millennials who, you know, everybody's in a different phase in their life. Um, so some people you know, aren't planning to have kids or aren't going back to school or have a job and aren't, you know, they're kind of in a more steady place and they're able to give more time. Other people, you might be able to get a few years of really dedicated service out of them. And then maybe they're going to need to take five or 10 years off. Maybe they'll still be a member, maybe they won't. Um, but I think it's vital to get them into Kiwanis at that age and get them interested in Kiwanis so that when they eventually if they have kids and come out the other side of that and have more time again, um, we'll know to look for Kiwanis again. First off, my computer is saying my internet connection is unstable, so I apologize if I go out <laughs> of this. But anyways, um, Will basically summed up everything that I told my friend earlier today when I saw this question, um, because I was like, how could you not pursue millennials? Like, you have to, if you want a club, you, you have to. Um, and with it being a time commitment thing, again, like Will said, it's, it just all depends on what people are doing in their life. I mean, we're 25 to 40 year olds, like, that's a very large range of life happenings <laughs> um, and big life events and who knows what's going on. Um, and so with the planning on time to serve, I'm, I would just say if someone is going, if someone joins a club and wants to serve, they're going to make it a priority. So that's really all it is. It's, you know, making sure you're providing something that's worth making it a priority in their life. And I would, I don't know, I think that's the best way to keep anyone coming back. I'm going to piggyback off of the two panelists that just went, but also with um, 
every year time is changing. So it's always going to be somebody with some new ideas to come in and, you know, show you um, what or help you to, to know how to navigate through di doing different stuff, basically. So it's good to pursue millenniums. And then also, do they have time to serve? It's, it's tricky because we're also building a career career or family or, or school and everything. So it's always hard to find time to, to you know, uh, show up, but then also at the same time, if it's in your heart, you know, to help the community, you always find time basically to do what you can, you know, for the time being, because you can always make it up a um, couple of weeks from now or anything like that to spend more time around your Q1 and family. I feel like you guys pretty much covered everything. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you should you should try to get millennials. I mean, you shouldn't any member is a good member. You should you should be we, we want more members. And like Danielle was saying before, we are we, we do know a lot of technology and stuff, and maybe some members are having trouble with that and we could help them. And I know for um for our club, it was hard at the beginning because we only did daytime meetings. But then we started adding more night meetings so people who are working during the day could come to our meetings and we started doing more Saturday service projects so people didn't have to leave work they didn't have to worry about all that and so it was it, we got more members involved that way. I think that's perfect, uh, Melissa. You touch upon our next question, which explores uh, what do you think Kiwanis or Kiwanis clubs could do to restructure meetings or socials um, to make um, things more attractive towards recruiting a millennial or Gen Zer? So um, I'll give you a moment to uh, think about it, but how about we start with Gary? All right. So. I'm gonna speak from experience for my club. Uh, what they have started doing was in the meetings, they started asking for the ideas of some of the younger members and also to be on the different community uh, committees that we held in order just to show people and the community that it is young people out there that's willing to learn and willing to push our club to go further. But uh, with the coronavirus, it's helped us our club to become more technology based and having more zoom meetings and also um, calling on the phone and everything like that but i i just sorry but i just think that if the community and more younger people see um us out there basically doing more than they will join Uh, yeah, I think my biggest thing, Melissa just touched on it, is the meeting times. Um, as someone who works nine to five, like I only get a 20 or a 30 minute lunch break. So if it's not on Zoom or not like outside of where I'm working, there's no way I could ever come to that. Um, but something that, you know, having these Zoom meetings, I think a lot of clubs, GBYP included, like, you get to realize that there's so many more possibilities with Zoom and being able to do things online. Um, and then I would say another thing that I think I've learned myself this year, um, I know Will has touched on like the financial struggles of a millennial, especially a young one like myself. <laughs> um, we don't have any money, but in order to fundraise, which is still necessary, I, I have found with us doing these fundraisers with activities attached. So like trivia night or the murder mystery um, or the 5K, like I'm giving money to also participate and for a good cause. And so in my head, like that makes sense. While obviously just handing over a check or whatever is obviously good. And if you can do that, great. For me right now, as I make budgets and do stuff, like there's a little bit of a disconnect there for me. Um, so I think being able to provide, again, something, you know, what can you provide to make it worth the dues, make it worth people giving you money and prioritizing Kiwanis, I think um, that's something that I've learned about myself even this year. 
Yeah, I think uh, meeting times is very big. Um, when I first joined a traditional Kiwanis club, they did three lunch meetings and one evening meeting per month. Um, and I found the lunch meetings very difficult. My work was extremely flexible. I went to my supervisor and said, hey, this is a big part of my life. This is something very important to me. And she basically said, okay, so you need to take a two hour lunch break, just work nine to six, make it up on the other end of the day, it'll be fine. But even with that flexibility, um, a couple weeks ago, Chris Marks gave a workshop and he mentioned a couple things to think about for Kiwanis meetings. Um, he talked about the Pledge of Allegiance, prayers, songs, and vegetarian meal options. And all four of those things, I don't think I've ever talked to Chris about this, but those were my four complaints um, when it came to those lunch meetings. Um, so my first experience, um, I'm an atheist. I was raised Christian, but I, I don't swing that way anymore. And I consider myself an atheist. And that's a very common thing among millennials. You know, I think uh, Carl mentioned earlier, we are more diverse than any previous generation in um, the United States, at least. And uh, with that comes religious diversity. So a greater percentage of millennials are not religious than any generation in the past. And also a greater percentage are going to have non-Abrahamaic religions. So they're not Christian or Jewish or Muslim, but maybe they're Hindu or Buddhist. Um, and so I think it's important for Kiwanis clubs to think about that because I walked into my first Kiwanis meeting and they said, welcome. And then everybody, they rang the bell, everybody stood up. They said, pledge allegiance to one nation under God. Then everybody sang, God bless America which by the way, I, I think if I walked into a restaurant and I heard a bunch of that group of people singing God Bless America in the back room, I would be very confused. Um, and then um, they said a, a prayer, not, not just an invocation, a, a Catholic Heavenly Father prayer. And I, the whole time that that introduction to that meeting was going on, I was standing there thinking to myself, if they knew that I was an atheist, would they want me in this room? Would they want me in this club? Um, I ended up joining because I needed to join. But if I didn't need to join Kiwanis to do Key Club, I'm not sure that I would have after that moment. Um, and then the other thing that was challenging for me at that time was I was a vegetarian um, for 10 years. Um, I gave it up a couple years ago. But I would go to these Kiwanis meetings and there's three options on, on the menu. None of them are vegetarian. So then I have to go kind of find the way just in the restaurant and say, hey, is there any way that you can do something for me? And at this particular restaurant, the, the option that they did for me was typically just a plain salad, like romaine lettuce, tomatoes, red onions, carrots, and, uh, and a dressing. And so I would eat that for lunch for $15 at this meeting. And then I'd go back to work and I'd already be hungry again and I'd have to buy a second lunch. So the commitment for that meeting for me was $15 plus the second lunch that I would buy back in my office cafeteria plus happy dollars. And, and it just kind of got to be a lot to the point where I, I stopped going to lunch meetings altogether because it was difficult and it was uncomfortable for me. Um, and so I think those are things that all Kiwanis clubs, I'm not saying you need to change everything, but be aware of that and be aware of how different people from different backgrounds might perceive those things that are very common to traditional Kiwanis meetings. And also do more hands-on service. That's the other thing. Um, so yeah, like I said before, we had to switch our meetings. We did have, it, it was kind of tricky <laughs> to get some of the members to agree to doing some night meetings, but I, I think it helped out to get some of our, our newer members, our younger members in. And, um, it also helped that we do any signups now for our, our service projects. We do um, a digital signup, but uh, it's called Sign Up Genius because they used to only put the signups at the meetings that used to be during the day. <laughs> so if you didn't go to a meeting, you're not signing up for anything. So now it's nice because you get an email, you just click whatever you want to do, like nine to ten, blah blah blah, and you're good. And then you show up for your shift. So that that has been very very helpful. So looking at um, the future, so um, what will happen 
when you are no longer a millennial? How will this impact Kiwanis? Uh, we can start off with uh, Danielle and then work towards Gary, Melissa, and then Will. Excellent question. Um, <laughs> so if I'm getting this correct, what will happen when I'm no longer a millennial? Okay. Um, well, obviously, again, I've got a long ways to go. Um, <laughs> as I'm the literal youngest <laughs> that one can be. Um, but I guess I think the only way for Kiwanis to grow is to adapt. I mean, there's gonna be more generations. You got Gen Z, you got whatever generations after that. Like you have to adapt um, and just taking, even if it's just like an easy poll at the end of the year to your club members, like, hey, what, what did you like? What did you dislike? What would you like to see in the future? Um, I guess that's how I would like to see things going. You know, maybe we have some telegraphic thing to do that on instead of a screen now, but um, I guess that would be my answer. <laughs> I think for me, I will always think of myself as one, no matter how, how old I'll get. Um, but just basically just adapting with the times and just bringing on fresh new um, talent who can, who can basically just help me to stay up with the times and what's going on. And also they will give me the opportunity to keep on being, uh, teachable and also for me to teach future generations about our club to help push us all together to one common goal for many years to come to survive. Sorry, I couldn't unmute for a minute. I was sad. Um, I like Gary's answer because I too will always think of myself as a millennial girl. I don't want to think of myself like, because then I'll feel very old. <laughs> but um, I guess um, when I get up in years, I just want to remember that change is okay. Even if the club has been doing it for th this and the, all these years, Sometimes new ideas are good. Sometimes you need a fresh perspective. You need you need change because without change, you're just your club's gonna stay stagnant and it's it's not gonna work. So just keep remembering. I'll just keep you know like how when people like Brian, me, other people came in, things changed, and down the years, I'm sure it will keep changing, and and that's okay. I think. Uh... That's a great answer, Melissa. I would say that I'd go a step further and say change is inevitable. It's just a matter of whether you embrace it or whether you try to resist it and, and let it control you. Um, so I think really the future of Kiwanis will be dependent on how Kiwanis clubs interact with change, whether they embrace it and, and are proactive about it or whether they just can, you know, fall by the wayside while their communities, while they become irrelevant to their communities. And it's something that's really sad for me. I, I live on the South shore in Massachusetts and there's so many communities around here that don't have Kiwanis anymore because those Kiwanis clubs stopped changing and eventually they, they faded away. And so I think, um, you know, I've, I've joked that if I, if I stay in my current job for the rest of my life, I max out my pension in 2052 and if Kiwanis is still around, that's when I'd like to run for governor. So I need, I need you all to support me by keeping Kiwanis around for another 30 years. Excellent. Um, we have uh, a question for Melissa and Danielle. Um, so um, some individuals heard that you were officers um, in your club. Could you talk about what brought you to step into that leadership role? Well, I was on the board for a year, just as a regular director. And then the secretary, she decided um, she didn't want to do it anymore. Um, real nice lady, but her, her husband had some health problems and she needed to help him out. 
And so they said, Melissa, would you like to do this? And I said, oh yeah, sure, why not? So six years later, <laughs> I'm still doing it and I enjoy it because I cannot be treasurer because me and math are not friends. But the secretary stuff, that that is okay with me. <laughs> um, like many things when it comes to uh... Kiwanis family officer positions. I have a game plan in mind and then it just kind of does its own thing. Um, so I last year intended to be president elect because I wanted time to figure things out. I'd only been in Kiwanis for one year and at that I was still in grad school. So life was just really, really hectic. Um, and so I really wanted to get like that information and kind of have like a practice run, um, but it just didn't work out like that. And we had ended up having an open position for president and I couldn't see it any other way besides saying yes. And I'll obviously I give my board a hard time all the time, <laughs> you know, doing this position and doing it again next year. But I, I think Qantas has made me born to be a leader at the same time. I don't know if that's even the thing, but it just, it feels right every time to help and lead uh, in the Qantas family. Excellent. Um, I have a question for uh, Will, but I'd love to get Gary's opinion as well. Um, our club is mostly older members, 70 plus. So we struggle with recruiting young people. What is one thing a Kiwanis club can do to start making their club more appealing to young people? Sure, I think uh, if you have a bunch of people who are 70 plus and you try to recruit someone in their 20s or 30s, it's going to be more challenging um, because that person is not necessarily going to feel as welcome in an environment, especially if those members have all been in the club for so long and they're so locked into their routines. Um, so maybe a good strategy would be to target trying to recruit a couple people in their 50s and 60s and then a couple people in their 40s and 30s and try to make the club progressively a little younger that way. Um, I think one other thing that is really important, um, I hope I'm not the one, the first person to say this, but uh, Kiwanians do some weird things. And uh, when you have a new person in the meeting, it's really helpful to have someone sit next to that new person and just explain what's going on. You know, so there's a guy, he's got a tea kettle with a horn on it, and he's going to honk the horn and tell people they owe him money. That's just a thing we do. We call it fines, you know, so just having somebody there to, to kind of translate those things that are so normal to a longtime Kiwanian, but are uh, maybe not normal to other people um, is a very helpful way to uh, make the, that meeting more inviting. For my personal experience, I think just um, showing up to different functions that we hear and basically uh, drives that we hear for, for money and, and anything else. When our people like our age, they see us more older than the, it's going to spark an interest to be like, okay, well, you know, I think I want to join. And also just occurring more on social media, whether it's our personal social medias, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, um, Snapchat and all is the new thing, occurring more there, then it's going to spark a lot of interest because people my age um, down here, they're into sports. So trying to change that interest into something else will be good. We can't forget about TikTok, right? Or maybe I'm just projecting. I spend way too much time on that app. Um, so Danielle, I have a question for you, but I think Will also can contribute to this really well. So the question says, Danielle, can you talk more about your strong relationship with your sponsoring club? Our club sponsors lots of service leadership programs, but um, most don't continue into Kiwanis. Any tips for how we can build stronger relationships? Yeah, so this kind of works back a little bit with the previous question that you asked. Um, so again, yes, Kiwanians do a lot of weird things, especially for me as a 
a sophomore in college going to a club that was predominantly older men there were literally two women in the club and I was then this just just very confused college girl <laughs> um and so I would say I just sat there by myself a lot at the time with like my other club members that came with me um and they did like well said kind of be like okay so this is what's gonna happen now just like they're gonna be weird they're gonna ask you questions it's fine um, but the turning point for me was I sat at the same table every week. Um, and we one of the we usually had they usually had a speaker. And so it was like you kind of had like chit chat in the beginning and then you didn't talk for like the rest of the time. Um and so one of the meetings we did a service project and we made neck pillows. And so my table was in charge was in charge of stuffing the neck pillows with the cotton or whatever. Um and that was the turning point basically for my relationship with my Qantas club because I finally got to talk to them and like really get to know them and they really got to know me and so literally from that point on it was Danielle oh my gosh like I literally just messaged the Muncie Qantas club the other day and was like I miss you guys like can I if you're doing things virtually like I would love to come in and see you like one of the Kwanians daughters lives in Boston and I met him here like I think that relationship, one, it helped that they paid for our meals. I'm not gonna lie. I wouldn't have gone if I had to pay for my own meals as a college student every Wednesday. Um, so that was a huge plus. Um, and they had a few younger-ish members. Um, and so we started, cause at that, once it was my senior year, I'd been going to club meetings for three years at that point. And so, I knew everyone and we started planning projects together. We would like Kiwanis one day, that's very known. We would have this huge like kickball tournament and we would help clean up the baseball park there. So it was just this huge event. Kiwanians came, they did what they could. Um, and then we would goof around and be at inter it'd be this whole thing. Um, so I think just, again, like I mentioned before, it's a two way street. Um, I know some Circle K clubs just don't really reach out which is fine every club is different um but my club we made it a point to have a relationship with our Kiwanis club and our Kiwanis club always made sure that we were they helped out with dues they helped out with our uh fall conference they helped out with decon they overly supported us just as humans they were always so excited for us and what our next steps were what positions we were having would we bring in the new officers for the year like it was honestly like a family experience um, and, and the basic Kiwanis family experience, like it was that, it was the pure definition of that. Um, so I think I got really lucky, but I don't think it's impossible for every club to have that. I think I rambled for a lot, but it was just really good. <laughs> it was a good experience. <laughs> Danielle, I had a similar experience when I was in Key Club. Um, I, I went to high school in Milford, Connecticut and um, the Kiwanis Club in Milford, they don't really come to district stuff at all, but they're a phenomenal club and they were very supportive of us in Key Club. So we went to one meeting a month. Um, they meet in the basement of a really good Italian restaurant and they paid for the meals. So both those things were in the plus column, um, but they, um, they were always very supportive of Key Club and they were always very excited to have us at meetings. Um, they had somebody speak at the meeting, which in hindsight is a great public speaking practice for a high school student. Um, but when we shared what we were doing as a key club, they were always, you know, so receptive and happy and told us that they were proud of everything we were doing. It was just a very positive relationship. Um, and they, they sponsored us to go to DECON every April. Um, so they would pay for a bus to take the two key club, two of the three key clubs from Milford up to Springfield. They paid for snacks. Um, they, you know, I don't know how much that cost them, but they, they, it was pretty sizable investment. Um, and I just remember going to Kiwanis meetings and more importantly, going to Kiwanis service projects. Um, one of the big things they do is flower sales. And so they would have us come and help. Uh, they do a Mother's Day flower sale, an Easter flower sale, and then they sell poinsettias every Christmas, which my mother is one of their top customers still to this day. Um, but we actually um, would do the poinsettia sale with them and get 
a portion of the proceeds for our key club. Um, but all of those interactions we had, I just always felt welcome in that club. And it left me with a very positive impression of Kiwanis. You know, I left high school saying, this is an organization that I could join one day. Um, and I think it did help that they had some, they, they didn't necessarily have young members, but they had members who were in their 40s and 50s who maybe had kids our age who were just more comfortable communicating with teenagers. And I think that that helped a lot as well. So I have a question for um, Melissa and Gary. That sounds like a TV show. Um, should clubs still do virtual meetings after the pandemic ends um, or in person or hybrid? What might attract millennials? Um, I, like, I like the hybrid idea because you do wanna still get to see people and eventually you want to get out of your house <laughs> but sometimes especially in the winter when the weather is bad I feel like um sometimes those zoom meetings they came in handy because you don't have to shovel you don't have to leave your house but in the warmer weather I feel like in person is nice and millennials I feel like it's nice we do just a service project to chat you get to know people and it's it's fun I would say both meet in person and on Zoom because anybody that can meet the, the meetings in person, at least we can connect on our phone, whether we're at work or, or basically on the road or traveling on a plane or something. So that'll be easy for everybody to connect. I think that um, something that came to mind that I think is really good to highlight um, I don't know if this happens in um, all the regions, but I know for a lot of Qantas clubs around me, they like to take the summers or the winters off. Um, like they just don't meet, um, whether that's like district authorized, I can't speak to that. Um, but um, something that got me thinking, if we're looking at a hybrid model, this might um, encourage some of our Qantas clubs that do um, take like a brief hiatus to maybe take it uh, virtually and still have that engagement um, over the summer or during the winter when people are quite literally going south um, and not going to meetings, it might be a great opportunity uh, to just re-engage some of those folks too. Um, and also maybe join Equanus if they decide to stay there permanently, who knows? Um, you know, soft plugs, soft plugs, yes. Um, so I have a question for everyone as uh, time's starting to wind down for the night, but one of our um, last few questions is, uh, what are good methods to promote Kiwanis to millennials who don't know about us at all? So we'll start with Will, go to Danielle, Gary, and Melissa. Sure. I think one of the most important things is to maintain a website and a Facebook page for your club. Um, I think that's something I've noticed in general. When I am looking for a plumber, a plumber for my house, I Google. You know, when I am looking to, to find a restaurant, I Google them and look at their menu online. So if I'm going to look to join an organization, if I Google that organization and I don't find anything, I'm going to assume it's not real and it doesn't exist. And therefore, I'm never going to even explore what is Kiwanis in my community. So I think just as a baseline um, to recruit millennials, you need to be Googleable, I guess. That's not a word, but it works. Okay, what I, what I was uh, say is, I will go back to what I said earlier, like go to, oh, hello? Okay, so I'll say, just go back to um, my earlier answer and just get each young person to basically post on their personal pages, social media pages about what they're doing, the different service product, um, projects and everything that you do. Also, basically just take more pictures and put them in the newspaper sometimes or on the online um, newspaper publications so people can see um, you're doing something and then the grandparents or the parents of 
the young people can be like, okay, well, you should do this too. You know, it will help you be a better person or anything like that. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to the maybe they've already Googled you and now they might be coming to an event sort of and kind of like getting them hooked in. Um, I would say show them rather than tell them, have them at a service project, do a fundraiser, like that's going to get them involved in that, like doing a project and then being like, oh my gosh, this is so fun. And then you can be like, oh, well, we're going to do this again. You should totally come. Also, this is what we are and this is what we do and what we stand for. Like, not that you shouldn't be like, yes, cool and it's woo, but also it's almost like tabling in college. Like, do you like puppies? You do. Okay, let's go to an animal shelter. Oh, by the way, we're Circle K International. Like that's what we used to do all the time. You gotta hook them in. Um, and so I think by actually doing the things that Kiwanis represents, so service fundraising, I think that helps everything. All right, I'm not sure what to say now because um, <laughs> I feel like you guys covered everything again. Um, but yeah, make sure your website is up to date. You don't want to say your meetings are at a restaurant that have, has closed two years because there's someone's going to try to go to that restaurant and there's going to be nobody there. And um, yeah, we got a Facebook a few years ago and that has been wonderful. Um, one of our members, Kate, she runs it and she's just fantastic. She Everything is up to date. There's always pictures, there's videos. Um, and also another thing we do is anytime we do a fundraiser or event, well, not anytime, a lot of times we'll put big billboards around the town and it's got our website on it and it's got our Facebook on it. So if anybody's driving by, they're like, oh, what the heck is that thing? And they'll Google it and it'll pop up. Excellent, thank you everyone. And for our last question of the evening to wrap us up, um, we're gonna ask each of our panelists in one minute or less to um, give us some takeaways you would like to share to those in the audience tonight. So we'll start with Danielle, go to Gary, Melissa, and then Will. Um, takeaways from the night. Um, I would say being adaptive and realizing that change is gonna happen whether you want it to or not. Like Will said, you just gotta get on board with it. Um, show them why they should join um, and bring back your small talk skills. I know it's been COVID, but you gotta start talking to people and just letting them know that you're there for them and actually have a decent conversation, even if it's about the weather. I want to thank everybody for showing up tonight to hearing our uh, view on everything in the Kiwanis Club. And I just think that everything that we say tonight, just take it away and, you know, write down some notes and go from there and talk to more young people who you come across, whether it's in your business or on the street or in your church or at the movie somewhere to get them more interested. Because I know I would do my job and post some more um, of the Kiwanis Club and everything and talk to my friends, you know, to get involved also. Um, I guess I would say that, um, I don't know. Well, thank you for hearing, just, you know, coming and listening to me ramble because I get nervous <laughs> with these things. Um, but I guess, if your club is changing, it's okay. And it's okay to be scared because it's new and everything, but you'll get through this and you'll, you'll learn new things and it's gonna work out. And always remember that new members are, I was very shy and it was such a relief to have members that were so welcoming and like kind and wanted to talk to me. So just put yourself in that new member's shoe and just think of when you were new and how shy you were and just make that person feel welcome and make them want to stay and um, serve the club. I think to uh, basically steal what everybody else said, um, you know, it's so important to be welcoming, but Kiwanis is all about serving the community. And, you know, the, the community and the traditions that we develop in our clubs is there to support the service that we do in the communities. 
And those traditions are going to change over time. New people are going to have different ideas. Um, and that change is uncomfortable, but it's necessary to continue that service for the next generation of children in our communities. And so I think I would just uh, leave it with that, that millennials want to serve. So welcome us into your clubs. Excellent. Thank you to everyone that came tonight and to our panelists. Um, it's been a great pleasure to be able to hear all the things that you've shared. I know that I took away some things. If you don't you know, I had my piece of paper taking notes. Um, so uh, thank you all for a great panel. And I'm going to pass it over to Brian to close out our evening. Thank you, Carl. And thank you to all of our panelists. Can everyone join me in a round of applause for um, our millennials who uh, put themselves out there tonight and spoke about their experiences, that was phenomenal. Um, and as a millennial myself, I found it very valuable to hear all your perspectives and insights. And like Carl said, I was taking notes and writing things down. So this was great. So I hope you all learned something too. Um, and a big thank you to Carl, Melissa, Gary, Danielle, and Will um, for being part of tonight's workshop. Uh, I want to say one of my favorite quotes, she won't be happy that I'm calling her out, but was from Melissa, who I'm very proud to have sponsored to join Kiwanis and was one of the best additions to our Meriden Club. And it was Kiwanis and giving back does my heart good. And I love that because I think that's a real powerful message that connects all of us as Kiwanians, no matter what our generation is. So um, thank you all again. And as we wrap up, uh, please remember to put your name and your club in the chat if you haven't already. That will help us keep accurate attendance. Um, according to Interclub Liaison Dave, a live report that's just coming in, we have 15 clubs represented so far. So make sure you put your name if you haven't already so that we don't leave you out of the club count. So looking ahead, um, we have one more membership month workshop in store for you. And I'll ask Elise to pull up her screen. So on May 26th, which is next Wednesday, we will end the month with planning a new member, new member orientation. Um, because it's important to remember uh, in the process of membership that when someone joins your club, your responsibilities are not over. We will teach the important parts of planning an introduction and orientation to your members and to make sure they understand Kiwanis and the impact we have on our communities. So join us next Wednesday um, where Elise and I will present that topic. And tonight we are announcing our June workshops. So Elise will pull up our next schedule. You're the first ones to hear this. All right, so we hope you will join us next month on Wednesday, June 2nd, we kick off the month with Joseph Lepper, who's the president of the Kiwanis Club of Springfield, Massachusetts. And Joe will be presenting on strategic planning for clubs. And he's gonna provide ideas and tips and a framework uh, for a strategic plan that will help you increase your impact in your community. Then on June 9th, we are presenting Chartering SLP Clubs. For those of you who may be new to Kiwanis, SLP stands for Service Leadership Programs. And those are the Kiwanis Initiatives, K-Kids, Builders Club, Key Club, CKI, and Action Club, the other parts of our Kiwanis family. And that evening, we will have Marianne Bellison, who's the CKI District Administrator. Will Bradford, who you met tonight, who's our Key Club District Administrator, past CKI District Governor, Allison Lunny, and immediate past Key Club Lieutenant Governor, Ana Rodriguez. And then on June 16th, our workshop will be using technology to organize your club. And that night we will provide tips and tricks for using platforms like Google Drive, Square, Venmo, and more for improving your club's organization. So if you're looking to streamline and pull some technology in, that's a session you don't wanna miss. On Wednesday, June 23rd, I will be leading a panel discussion on literacy focused service projects. And we're gonna highlight some really outstanding club projects from all around New England and Bermuda that focus on reading and children's literacy. And you'll definitely leave with some inspiring ideas that you can bring right back to your own community. And you'll hear from really great clubs that are doing really important work. And our final June workshop will be on the 29th and we'll have how to build diverse community partnerships. And if you can join us, you're really in for a treat with this session. We are hosting two key club members, Harper Treshek and Jordan Stein from the Fairfield Ludlow High School Key Club in Fairfield, Connecticut. 
and they're going to talk about how their members worked with community organizations in shared service projects to help feed the community. They're going to provide resources, action steps, and inspiration to jumpstart your own community partnerships. And these two young leaders presented this session for the Key Club District Convention um, held in April, and they were outstanding. So we've asked them to come join us. So that will be on June 29th, and we'll wrap up our month. Elisa is going to drop a link in the chat so you can be among the first to register for these June workshops. Uh, we opened up registration just a few minutes ago, and we hope you will sign up tonight to join us next month. This form and more information will also be sent out by email later this week. Now, following these June workshops, we are going to provide club officer training on Wednesday evenings in July and August, as well as two sessions on leadership. And we're going to have those um, workshops and that schedule available very soon. And we're really going to ask for your help to spread the word to ensure that all club officers know about and take advantage of these free virtual trainings. Following our July and early August officer workshops, your next opportunity for Kiwanis education will be at the district convention. Uh, the board met this past Sunday and the convention will be in person this summer, August 20th to the 22nd in Lemonster, Massachusetts. Following the convention and beginning in September, our virtual workshop series will move to once per month. We hope you'll continue to join us as we uh, move out of the summer and into the fall with our monthly workshops to keep the Kiwanis education going. As always, a reminder to please encourage your fellow club members to join us for these free sessions. You can continue uh, to find information about our virtual workshops on the district Facebook page, in our Facebook group, and as always at newenglandkiwanis.org. We have a playlist on YouTube and Elise will provide a link in the chat so that you can share recordings of our workshops with your fellow club members at any time if they weren't able to join us live. So those are ongoing resources that will always live on YouTube for you to share with your members. If you'd like to access any of the resources from our past workshops, you can take a look at the confirmation email you received this morning. And if you scroll to the bottom, you will see a link to virtual workshop materials and that will take you to our Google Drive folder where you can find presentations and resources from all of our past workshops going back to June, excuse me, December. And that's also where you'll find the attendance list for your secretaries to report interclubs. I hope you will join me in a round of applause and a thank you to the District Education Committee, Elise DeNorfia, Judy Barrett, and David Griffin, who are helping behind the scenes to make these workshops successful. And as I said at the beginning tonight, we're on our 23rd week, and this team is doing so much to provide all of this education for you. So please give them a round of applause or send them a message in the chat to really show how much we appreciate their help. And with that, thank you again to our amazing presenters and to Carl for being our moderator. And a special thanks to each of you for joining us and participating in this workshop series. I hope you leave tonight with a different perspective and maybe some ideas and inspiration for recruiting millennials to your club. Please be safe, be well, and we hope to see you next week for our session on planning a new member orientation. Have a great night.